Hi, today we're going to talk about absorption and emission spectroscopy. So we're going to cover a wide range of topics relating to various sorts of spectroscopy. And we're going to start with how absorption and emission spectroscopy work on a chemical level, then talk about why we can measure concentrations using spectroscopy, and finally discuss one sort of absorption and one sort of emission spectroscopic instrument. Because we're talking about spectroscopy and therefore the electromagnetic spectrum, we're going to have to talk a bit about light both as a particle, that is a photon, and as a wave. So let's start by talking about the wave nature of light. We tend to talk about three measurable aspects of light as a wave, which are first wavelength, the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave, Second, amplitude, which is how tall the wave is, or the distance from the peak of one wave to the trough of that same wave. And finally, frequency, which is the number of waves that pass a point within a given period of time. So in this case, if this is what passes the point in that given period of time, we can count one, two complete waves during that period of time. Now, frequency and wavelength are related. You probably learned about that in Gen Chem. As you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, as wavelength increases, frequency decreases, and vice versa. Energy is directly related to frequency and inversely related to wavelength. So again, high frequency radiation is high energy, and long wavelength radiation is low energy. But what about amplitude? That isn't something we frequently talk about in Gen Chem. Basically, you can think about the amplitude of a light wave in a couple of different ways. The first is to consider how strong or intense the light is. The second is to think of light in particle format, and then you can realize intensity or amplitude is how many photons of that wavelength are hitting at any given time. So now let's discuss the basic principles of atomic absorption. If you think back to those electron configuration diagrams that you did in general chemistry, you will remember there were a few rules regarding where electrons go. For example, the Pauli exclusion principle said that you couldn't have two electrons with the same set of four quantum numbers. There was also the Aufbau principle, which said that you had to start filling in the lowest energy level before filling in the next highest energy level. Now, it's not that you can't fill in higher energy levels. Rather, if you put an electron in a higher energy level, it will naturally fall down to a lower energy level. Now, remember also that each of these orbitals represented in an electron configuration diagram has a discrete energy associated with it. That energy is not just related to factors like how far from the nucleus it is, but also how many protons are in the nucleus. So the energy of a 3p orbital in a sodium atom would be different from that of a 3p orbital in potassium. Now, electrons aren't necessarily stuck in these particular orbitals. With addition of enough energy, you could move, let's say, the 4s electron up to 4p. And because each of those levels has a discrete energy associated with it, you'd need to put in a specific amount of energy to do that. Now, one way to do that is to hit it with a photon of light with exactly the right amount of energy, which corresponds to a photon that has a particular wavelength and frequency. So if you do that, the electron is now in what we call an excited state. That is something that is not the lowest energy configuration. And of course, the atom is going to gradually want to find a way to return to what we call the ground state, the lowest energy configuration. As the electron moves back down, it gives off energy. Although it can lose energy in a variety of ways, the easiest way is to emit it as a photon and that photon will in and of itself have a particular wavelength, frequency, and energy. So the processes that we're talking about here are atomic absorption, where you put energy in and the electron moves, and atomic emission. Both of these processes are things we can use to identify elemental composition. Even if we're talking about molecules, we still have to worry about where do all the electrons go, and so you might remember doing these lovely molecular orbital diagrams. Here I've got one for molecular oxygen. But if you look at this diagram, the energies of the various molecular orbitals are here in the center. You can see that up at the top, there is an empty orbital. This happens to be an anti-bonding orbital, but it is an orbital. And with the right energy, you can take one of these 
highest energy electrons and you can pop it up to the sigma star 2p antibonding orbital. Now, a lot of molecules are a little more complicated than what you see here. And the easiest ones to look at with molecular absorption spectroscopy, at least UV vis spectroscopy, are molecules with conjugated pi bonds, especially polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. Most of the time when you're evaluating colored compounds by UV vis, you're looking at one of these PAHs. So in order to think about how to analyze what you observe as you use an instrument like a UV vis spectrometer, you need to think about the difference between transmittance versus absorbance and when you would use one of those quantities over another. So let's start out with transmittance because I think that's the easiest to understand. If you think about what happens as light passes through a substance, there are really only two possibilities. Either the light passes straight through the substance without any change to its path or something about the substance changes the path of the photon as it moves through. If you're talking about an aqueous solution, one thing that might happen is that one of the photons of light might interact with an electron or something of one of the dissolved molecules. So in general, light that has passed through a substance will have a lower intensity than when it entered in other words, if you put in a certain number of photons, you're going to get a smaller number of photons out. Transmittance is defined as the ratio of the intensity of light leaving the substance divided by the intensity of light entering the substance. So in this cartoon, we have four photons entering the substance, but only one coming out. So our transmittance is one, which is what's coming out, divided by four, which is what went in. And we also sometimes talk about the percent transmittance, which is just the percent of the original intensity that exits the substance. Here, that's one-fourth or 25%. Now, what affects how much light is transmitted? First of all, it's dependent on the substance that the light is passing through, which is probably fairly obvious to anyone who has observed the world. A lot of light passes through glass, while very little passes through fabric. Secondly, the transmittance of a substance depends on how much of that substance the light has to pass through. So here we have an aliquot of substance that has a transmittance of 90%. If the light has to pass through another similar aliquot of substance, it will lose another 90% of what entered the second swath. So the total amount of light that gets through to the other side will be 0.90 times 0.90 or 0.90 squared. And you could see that if there's a third similar aliquot that's added onto the far side, we are going to lose another 90% of what came out the second swath. So our total transmittance would be 0.90 cubed. In other words, transmittance is exponentially related to the path length that the light has to pass through. So now let's talk about a different scenario. Here we have an aliquot of sample that absorbs 50% of the light. What happens if we put in double the amount of molecules as we did before, but instead of putting them in next to our original aliquot as we did the first time, we're gonna put them in the same container. In other words, what if we double the concentration? And now again, this is gonna be an exponential relationship. The first set of molecules has a transmittance of 0 0.50, while the second set of molecules also has a transmittance of 0 0.50. So our total transmittance is 0 0.50 squared. So you can see there are a couple of factors that affect transmittance exponentially. You know, we scientists love to make things linear. So we've created a different variable that we call absorbance, which we define as the negative log of the transmittance. So you can see that if the transmittance is decreasing exponentially with increasing path length, that means absorbance will increase linearly with increasing path length. So let's look at a couple of instances of how transmittance, percent transmittance, and absorbance are related to each other. The highest value you can have for transmittance is one, which corresponds to a percent transmittance of 100%. Basically, that means all of the light gets through. The corresponding absorbance value is zero. In other words, no light is absorbed because all of the light is getting through. A transmittance of 0.1 corresponds to 10% transmittance, which means that 10% of the light is getting through. The corresponding absorbance value is one. 
Now, a transmittance value of 0.01 is a 1% transmittance, which also corresponds to an absorbance of 2. So you can see that as the transmittance value decreases, the absorbance value increases. Now, we try to set things up so we don't get readings above an absorbance of 2 because it means that very little light is getting through. That makes it hard to quantify anything accurately. So this brings us to Beer's Law, which you've probably seen before in some form or another. We've seen how transmittance is exponentially related to the path length that the light travels through, as well as the concentration in an aqueous solution. And that explains why both of those quantities are linearly related to the absorbance. We often measure absorbance rather than transmittance when we are doing UV-Vis spectroscopy. But you're going to see that we are going to use transmittance in other forms of spectroscopy that we talk about later. So in class, we talked through how a UV-Vis spectrometer is set up. Now we're going to talk about two different spectroscopic instruments, one absorbance, one emission, both of which are designed for atomic analysis that is, quantifying the elemental composition of a sample. The first instrument is what we call an AA, or Atomic Absorption Spectrometer. As always, with spectroscopy, we start out with a source. Here, our source is what we call a hollow cathode lamp. Now, a hollow cathode lamp is specially designed to emit light in a very narrow band of wavelengths. But it doesn't quite work like UV-Vis in that this lamp does not shine directly through the sample the way that a UV-Vis spectrometer would. Instead, you've got a gas burner. Now, there's several gases that might be burned in AA spectroscopy. The most common is acetylene. So whatever you're burning, you're always going to have a very intense flame. The sample is sucked up through a little tube into a nebulizer, which turns it into a fine spray that is injected into the flame, and that completely vaporizes it. Meanwhile, we've got the light from our hollow cathode lamp shining through the flame. Some of the electrons in the sample are going to be excited by that light and will absorb particular frequencies depending on where the electrons are moving to. The light then enters a monochromator where the correct wavelength is selected before it enters the PMT4 detection. Now, one way in which the setup differs from the UV-Vis spectrometer that we were looking at in class is that here the monochromator is after the sample, but before the detector, whereas in the UV-Vis it was before the sample. So I want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about why there are these two different setups, and then we're going to talk about it in class. Now we're going to talk about a similar and yet also fairly different instrument, the inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrometer. Now, most people refer to this instrument as ICP-OES, which stands for optical emission spectrometer. So here we go. The diagram I'm going to show you here is simplified. And because it's simplified, it looks very similar to the AA that we looked at in the last slide. So we're going to start with some sort of aerosolized sample and put it into a high energy environment, which causes the sample to emit light. So here's the first obvious difference. The last instrument measured absorbance, while this one measures emission. Again, we have the monochromator next, followed by a detector, which this time is a CCD. And the reason that it uses a CCD rather than a PMT is that that allows the instrument to collect many different wavelengths at once. But other than that, it does look very similar to what we saw in the AA. But there is a noticeable difference if you make this diagram a little more complicated, and that is in the high energy environment. So the flame in the AA just vaporized the sample, but here, the high energy environment, the plasma, is going to actually cause the sample to emit light. Instead of a flame, we have an inductively coupled plasma. So this is the way that area works. First of all, we have our sample introduction tube, which comes from the nebulizing chamber where it gets turned into an aerosol. Around the sample introduction tube is this tube carrying liquid argon. At the top of the argon tube, which is what we call the torch, we've got an RF coil. This induces voltage around the torch, which heats everything up and turns the argon into plasma. Now, the interesting thing about the ICP torch setup 
is that the argon serves two purposes. First, it's fuel for the plasma, but because it's also entering in liquid form, it serves as a coolant for the torch to keep it from melting despite the high heat. So the advantage of using ICP OES instead of AA is that the higher energy of the plasma allows you to vaporize sample much more effectively, which means that the ICP OES can detect analytes with a much lower detection limit. Because it's more sensitive, the detector does get maxed out a lot more easily. So for high concentrations, the AA can actually be preferred. So we've touched on a lot of different points about atomic absorption and atomic emission spectroscopy. Basically, we use them to discover elemental composition and the concentrations of the elements that compose a sample. We've only talked briefly about molecular absorption spectroscopy, but we're going to come back to that in a couple of weeks. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.